Hello and welcome to the Evergreen Building at the College of Southern Idaho. Uh, we're here in the geology classroom, continuing our series on rocks, specifically sedimentary rocks. This is our last in the sedimentary rock series. So we'll begin our next series of videos looking at metamorphic rocks. Uh, this is Rock Identification with Wilsey. I'm your host, Sean Wilsey, geology professor here. And today we're gonna focus on two biochemical sedimentary rocks, chert and coal, very dissimilar rocks, but um, two that are fairly important in the world of sedimentary rocks and the stories that they can tell. So let's go ahead and start with our, our notes as we often do. And these are always available uh, under the description. So if you want to get a hold of these, I have links to these in PDF form and you can have your own uh, copy of these if you're so inclined. Um, okay, so so let's start with chert. Chert's an interesting rock. Um, in the world of sedimentary rocks, it's actually one of the more resistant and hard of all the biochemical sedimentary rocks. You might see some other names out there for it, like flint or jasper. It's totally made out of very fine crystalline, finely crystalline, or what we call cryptocrystalline quartz, essentially a material called chalcedony. And quartz, of course, is made out of silicon dioxide, or what we call silica. And so it's a very hard, resistant material. It's fairly inert chemically. Uh, it doesn't dissolve very easily unless the temperatures are, are elevated. And it's very hard, so it tends to be a type of material that, that persists and sticks around for a long time. So one of the more desirable properties of chert is not only its hardness, but it tends to break along sort of these curved surfaces, what we call conchoidal fracture. And this is what made chert a valuable resource to uh, ancient cultures, Native Americans, was the fact that they could take chert, like obsidian, with this, these hard and the hard, hard properties and the conchoidal fracture property, and they could take this chert and shape it into tools like arrowheads, uh, spearheads, and other useful tools that they used uh, at, at that time. There's a lot of different colors that are possible with chert, which all stem from the various impurities within it. So I'll show you here several different set of colors and varieties of chert. Um, and then there's basically two main ways that we get chert. So it has an interesting origin and, and it can be one of several origins, but obviously to, to create chert, you're gonna need an environment with a lot of silica. And so we need a source for the silica in order to concentrate that material and form chert. One location where we see chert forming is in the deep ocean environment, where there are a lot of microorganisms, many of which have calcite exoskeletons, which would then rain down on the seafloor and form limestone. But there's also quite a few organisms in the ocean that have silica exoskeletons. And two examples of those are diatoms and radiolarins, these microscopic organ, microorganisms with structures and exoskeletons made out of silica. We also have sponges that can live in a variety of water conditions, but they do also form in the deep ocean and they have silica as their main sort of hard part that makes up their uh, anatomy, these things called spicules. And so in either case, we can have these types of microorganisms um, die on the seafloor and then that silica can actually be mobilized by groundwater and then redeposited or precipitated as uh, beds of chert or in some cases these kind of blobs of chert we call nodules. Uh, the other environment which we sometimes see chert forming is if we have perhaps a volcanically a volcanic environment with a lot of high silica rocks like rhyolite or um, vitrophere or obsidian, basically rocks that have high silica content. If we have hot water, hot fluids moving through those rocks, maybe in a geyser or a hot spring environment, we can dissolve some of that silica and then re-precipitate it into chert. And so you sometimes see chert or forms of chert around these geysers or hot springs in different uh, kind of hydrothermal volcanic environments. And then the last thing here, I kind of mentioned this already, but we oftentimes see chert associated, not exclusively, but sometimes, and it's pretty common, with limestone. So this should make sense because at the seafloor, we've got these microorganisms 
made out of calcite exoskeletons, which will form the limestone, but we also have the silica exoskeleton organisms that can form the chert. And so you sometimes get limestone and chert interbedded and forming uh, in the same sedimentary unit. Let's look at a couple of different varieties of chert and hopefully help you here uh, understand it a little bit better. So we've got several different uh, examples here. We can just go through these more or less one at a time. Um, but you can see the sort of curved, you can see the hard nature of this material, these kind of curved fractures. This is the conchoidal fracture. Uh, if I turn it on its edge, you can see how sharp this can be and, and how uh, a person with the right skills could use pressure flaking to actually break this in a controlled manner such that they get a very sharp uh, edge that might be useful for tools or weapons. So here's some nice brown shirts. Here's a, a nice piece of kind of green, piece of green, somewhat kind of banded uh, shirt. But we can see that the properties are the same. This conchoidal fracture uh, might be a little bit shiny, a little bit of a glassy texture to it. It's finely crystalline. This is maybe more typical here uh, of shirts, these kind of more beige, more subdued kind of colors in there. Again, it could be iron oxidation or other impurities that, that sort of yield some of those colors we see. Just kind of a nice kind of gray shirt, but again, sharp edges uh, and definitely hard resistant material. This has a hardness of seven since it's made out of quartz. And so compared to a lot of the other sedimentary, especially biochemical sedimentary rocks, these tend to be quite resistant. Uh, these samples, I believe, I didn't collect these, these are in our collection, but these are uh, pieces of chert, but actually they call this flint that occurs in some of the chalk deposits in Dover in England. So you've probably heard of the White Cliffs of Dover, which are mainly made out of a limestone, a white powdery limestone called chalk, but there are little blobs and nodules of flint or essentially chert uh, interbedded with that. So here's some nice examples uh, of that. And then just so you can kind of see how the chert looks with the limestone, this is a piece from Southern Utah. We can see the gray limestone here. We talked about these carbonate rocks last time. And then the chert forming these kind of blobs or just kind of little uh, just embayments or uh, just little crazy shapes. Usually they're kind of rounded though, ovals, blobs, somewhat circular features uh, within the limestone. The chert is a lot harder than the limestone, and so it will tend to stick out. You can probably see that a little bit here, that the chert's actually sticking out of the limestone in relief because it's made out of silica, which is much harder than this soft and soluble calcite material here. Uh, and then the last thing here, this is actually a, a local example in southern Idaho. I don't know if I've seen this in other places, but this is this is actually a chert breccia. So you can see, if we kind of zoom in here, uh, this, this looks a lot like chert here. It's definitely hard, uh, breaks in conchoidal fractures, although I, I don't know if it's the type of chert that someone would turn into tools. But then we can see that a lot of this material is um, fragmented. We can see these different particles in here, class of material. So fundamentally, this is a breccia. We talked about those with our clastic sedimentary rocks, but because all the particles in here are chert, all the gravel sized particles are in here are chert and they're angular, we could be more specific with our identification of this rock and call it a chert breccia, just kind of a modifier there. So, okay, let's look at our, our next biochemical sedimentary rock, and that is coal. Um, coal, as most people know, is a fossil fuel. It's used to used to uh, burn and generate electricity. Uh, it has an important role to play in just sort of the industrial revolution when coal was the primary energy source. Uh, it can be black or brown and it's completely made out of organic carbon. It's combustible, which means it's flammable. Um, and coal's main depositional environment, where it forms is in swamps. So in these swamps, we get vegetation accumulating in the water, but because the water is stagnant, and there's not a lot of movement in the water, that vegetation doesn't really decay much. So it accumulates on the bottom uh, of the swamp. And over time through compaction, it gets squeezed into various types or grades of coal. So at the lowest end, basically barely a rock, if you want to call it that, uh, lightly or not intensely compacted swamp vegetation, we would have peat. 
um, and you might re you might uh, see this word be something that you're familiar with because uh, we have peat moss that you can get at the nursery that helps your plants grow in your garden. So that's a, a form of coal. Uh, then we have bituminous coal, which is sort of a medium grade. So we've compacted that peat a little bit more. This is a black rock, kind of shiny, that we oftentimes use to uh, generate electricity. So it's used in power plants. And then at the upper end of the heat and pressure of this this swamp vegetation, we have a rock that's technically considered a metamorphic rock called anthracite. And we might uh, spend some more time with that when we cover metamorphic rocks. But I wanted to show you the whole progression of coal from low grade, you know, barely compacted swamp vegetation to something in the middle and then something at the higher end. And the, the, the real uh, common denominator here is just the amount of compaction, the heat and the pressure that's being applied to this swamp vegetation. We sometimes see uh, pyrite, a mineral we uh, focus on in the mineral series. Uh, if there's a lot of sulfur in the rock, then some of the iron is uh, combined with sulfur to form pyrite. Of course, when that pyrite gets exposed, whether we're coring that out of a hillside or in a mining situation, uh, that pyrite and that uh, will then become oxidized, that iron gets oxidized a little bit. And then I thought it would be worthwhile to maybe just briefly go over some of the regions in the US um, where we have different deposits and reserves of coal. Uh, so in the Rocky Mountain area, the coal tends to be a lot younger. So we have mainly bituminous coal, lower grade coal, and it ranges from Cretaceous to Eocene in age, so like 50 to 90 million years. And this coal, um, it's, it's interesting when you think about it, because I think Wyoming is the biggest coal producer in the U.S. And you look at Wyoming today and it's uh, kind of cold and windy. It's a high desert. Uh, but it's interesting to think that, you know, just a few million years ago, it was a lush, uh, semi-tropical, swampy area uh, that formed a lot of uh, thick coal deposits during that time. As we move east into the Midwest and Appalachian region, these regions have uh, essentially the same age and environment of coal deposits, mainly in the Pennsylvanian to Mississippian, or what our friends across the pond in, in the UK call the Carboniferous period. And so this was a time when this part of the US sat uh, very close to the equator, and there was a lot of uh, plant productivity, swamps, tropical vegetation, and so we have these thick deposits of coal that are mined in this part of the US. Uh, the coal tends to be a little bit softer in the Midwest. And as you head up into the Northeast, into the New England area and uh, Pennsylvania, we start to see a little bit of anthracite. So there was a little bit more um, heating and compaction of that coal, uh, which happened when Africa collided with the Eastern margin of North America and, and metamorphosed or heated up and, and squeezed those rocks a little bit more. So um, just wanted to show you a couple, couple examples of these. So this is a, a good example of peat. It's actually very lightweight. Um, it's very crumbly. It's easy to break this apart. Uh, it's, it's again, not far removed. Basically, if you just crush this up, this is peat moss that you can buy in bags at your local nursery. But you can see roots. You can actually see the organic plant material, uh, pieces of bark, roots, little twigs. Sometimes you might even be able to pick out leaves uh, within within this piece of peat, this peat uh, coal here. So this is very low grade um, coal here. Uh, as we compact and heat up the coal a little bit more, we get a type of coal called bituminous coal. So now it's a little bit more compacted, it's blacker. You can't see as well the organic material in it. Uh, here's another piece here. Here's a kind of a thinner piece, but it is quite brittle. So you tend to be able to break it apart pretty easily. So it's hard, brittle, but it is lightweight. So again, it's just made out of squished plants. So this material is fairly lightweight. Uh, so this would be examples of bituminous coal. Uh, and then, get a little mess here. At the upper end is, is anthracite. And anthracite from a distance can look a lot like obsidian. It's black, it's glassy. It has that conchoidal fracture that we have with obsidian. Um, but unlike obsidian, it's it's fairly light in weight and it's made out of squished plants. So this is not something you're going to be able to shape. It's still fairly soft. In fact, I can probably, yeah, break off a piece pretty easily. It's fairly brittle. It's soft. 
Uh, there's no way I could do that with a piece of obsidian because it would just cut my hands open. So this is what high grade uh, metamorphic coal looks like, anthracite. So um, hopefully that was helpful. Just kind of gave you a quick review there of some different types of biochemical sedimentary rocks, the chert and the coal. I believe that concludes our sedimentary rock overview. So next time we'll start in with the metamorphic rocks. I'm not sure how many videos that will encompass, at least two, maybe three. Uh, so we'll focus on the metamorphic rocks. And again, with the goal of getting you the skills and the knowledge you need to identify these rocks on your own and have feel a little bit more empowered and confident in trying to understand and, and read the rock record wherever you may be. So appreciate everyone's support uh, and viewership, and we'll see you next time.